Welcome everyone to the February quarterly update about spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts hosted by the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. Today we are joined by two MDAR staff people, Elizabeth Barnes and Astra Perkins, and also we are going to be featuring a presentation by Phil Lewis from the USDA. So I'm going to skip that because we already covered it. And I think I'm just going to turn things over to Elizabeth for a refresher about SLF and what to be looking for, um, especially at this time of year. Elizabeth, you, if you want to share your screen, I just want to remind folks, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will try to get to them as soon as we can. We are going to hold the general speaker questions until the end when all speakers have had a chance to present. And great. All I'm right. All right, take, you... take it away. Oh, sorry. Can you yeah. see my slides okay? Yes, we see your slide, your presentation. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview about spotted lantern fly today. All right. Um, and I'm going to unfortunately be turned to the side from where my video is because it's popped up on my other screen. I, I apologize for that. Um, so spotted lanternfly is an invasive sap sucking insect. They are uh, true bugs, which means even though they look an awful lot like butterflies and moths, they're actually more closely related to things like plant hoppers and cicadas. They have been introduced a few times around the world in different countries, including Korea and Japan. Um, but they were uh, first introduced into the United States in around 2014. For the first couple of years, we thought, you know, maybe they're not going to be too bad here. But then there was a big spike in the population size. And since then, they have been spreading across the Northeast and even into the Midwest. Um, now, I do want to note there's still a lot we need to learn about them. Often invasive species uh, behave differently in their introduced range than their native range, and even differently in different countries that they've been introduced into. Um, so we will give you today the most up-to-date information that we have about spotted lanternfly, but I really recommend if you have to deal with them in person anytime in you know, the next few years to go back again and find out what the latest recommendations are. And you know, of course, if you're having trouble finding some information, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to try and direct you towards um, the information that you're looking for. So spotted lanternfly have a piercing sucking mouth part. It's basically a little straw that they stick right through the plant bark into the tree, and then they drink the sap from the tree. And they will feed on a lot of plants. They have over a hundred different host plants, everything from something as small as basil all the way up through something as big as a maple. However, they do have plants that they tend to prefer over others. Now, this shows the preferences in Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, it's, it may be the same in Massachusetts. It may be a little bit different because we have a slightly different forest composition here. So we'll kind of have to wait and see about that. But I think that this shows a good starting point. Um, now, spotted lanternfly do shift the plants that they're focused on over the course of the summer. Near the beginning of the summer, they're uh, more likely to be found on smaller, thinner barked plants and the new shoots of plants. Uh, so things like roses, perennials, and then later in the summer, they switch over more towards larger plants that may have thicker bark like black walnut, uh, sumac, and, and maples. Now, you will note, however, that they are found on grape and tree of heaven throughout the course of the summer, and they only really sometimes move away towards the end of the summer from those. So those are really their favorite host plants. Plant damage um, is going to vary by a few different factors. First, what species of plant is it? Some plants can tolerate spotted lanternfly feeding better than others. Um, second, you know, how many spotted lanternfly are feeding on them? If it's only a few, it's probably okay. The plant can probably tolerate that. But if there's a lot of them, that's when we start to see more serious issues. And then finally, you know, how healthy is the plant to begin with? That can have an effect as well. Now, for most of their host plants, that hundred list that I, I mentioned before, 
they usually have a relatively minor impact. You might see some wilting of leaves, but usually they'll perk back up as the, the summer progressives and the lanternfly move on. So they are a stress on the plant, but they're unlikely to outright kill the plant. However, we aren't sure what the long-term impact is going to be yet. If uh, we could see some, um, have the lanternfly feeding combined with things like disease, drought, construction damage, other insects, many years of feeding. Um, and, you know, we don't know what that's going to mean in terms of those multiple stresses piling on top of each other. So that's something to kind of keep an eye on. Now, there are some exceptions. Uh, tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, Sumac, Grape, and some smaller saplings of some of those other post plants from earlier can be more seriously impacted by lanternfly. Now, of course, Tree of Heaven is also invasive, so who cares? But those other plants we are worried about. Um, we've seen some dieback of small branches, loss of leaves, and even full death of the plant. Um, grapes are particularly badly uh, affected by spotted lanternfly feeding. You can lose vines in as little as a single season of feeding. And in some cases, uh, the vines that survive that heavy feeding produce grapes that have kind of a, a bad taste to them. Additionally, we may see weeping from the trunk of the trees and the buildup of foamy, frothy slime flux at the base of the tree. Um, if this is on a tree of heaven, uh, it smells particularly awful because as some of you may know, tree of heaven has a kind of rancid peanut butter smell to it. And when you get this slime flux, you can smell that from a good distance away. Now, there are some additional effects beyond just the plant damage. Uh, spotted lanternfly also produce something called honeydew, which is this lovely poetic way of saying sticky sugary insect pee. Uh, it gets all over everything underneath where the lantern flies are feeding. Um, they actually like squirt it out. Um, so it's, it's very messy. Um, it attracts stinging insects like bees, hornets, yellow jackets. They all love to feed on this honeydew. And it can grow sooty mold which if that sooty mold ends up on plant leaves, um, it can interfere with the plant's ability to photosynthesize. Um, again, not entirely sure what that's gonna mean long-term for the understory near where the spotted lanternfly are, but certainly if it's a tree that's over a garden area or if it's a street tree and there's a, a small planting under the street tree, um, that is not what you're uh, what you would desire um, to have this like black sooty mold all over it. It can also get all over property. So this photo shows uh, somebody's steps. The top two steps have still have the honeydew with sooty mold on it. The bottom step has been power washed to clean it off. Um, so you can see that if you end up with this over and over over the course of the summer, as it builds up again and again, it can just be a, a kind of a nuisance. It's something getting in the way of your ability to enjoy the outside. So they harm some plants and they are a general nuisance. Now, we want to teach you how to identify them so that if you see one, you can let us know. We still really want you to let us know if you see one in Massachusetts. Some other states have had, you know, just so many lanternfly everywhere that they know that it's there and they're putting out the messaging to just stomp it if you see it. In Massachusetts and in most of New England, as far as I, I am aware from talking to other people from other New England states, um, if you see one, we want you to get a picture first. And then if you're sure it's a lanternfly, you know, feel free to stomp it, that's fine. But we want that picture so that we have confirmation that there was a lanternfly there. They are little escape artists sometimes. So if you go to stomp it and it escapes, then you lose the evidence that the lanternfly was there. So what do they look like? Well, in their first through third instar, they're actually pretty nondescript. Um, from around May to July, they are these small little black insects with white spots. Um, they're pretty tiny when they first hatch out. You can see that's my thumb in the picture. Here's my thumb for scale for those of you who can see the video right now. Um, and they're, they're not usually noticed by, um, you know, most people unless they're really swarming over a particular plant or you're looking for them. Uh, sometimes people get them mixed up with ticks, but you can see that they've got way more white spots on them than you would ever see on a tick. So that's a good way to tell the difference. 
For the fourth instar, they get a bit more flashy. Now they are red with white spots and some black patches on them. Typically, we start seeing the fourth instar in around July, and you can see them into September. The adults first start showing up in July, and they can last all the way until the first hard freeze. Now, you know, here in New England, that could be in mid-October, that could be until late December, it just depends on the year. Um, they have uh, these gray-brown wings. So that top layer of wings is gray-brown. It is spotted with spots on the first two-thirds and then a kind of lacy pattern on the last third of the wings. And those bright colors that you see in a lot of pictures are typically hidden when they're at rest. Now, if they are dead, dying, uh, in flight, or if you've done what I've done here and you've caught one to try and get a good photo of it, you might see those brightly colored wings. Um, they're pretty flashy. They're, um, you know, unfortunately quite beautiful. You know, I have to acknowledge that. Um, but they have this uh, nice uh, red stripe with black spots on them, then a swoosh of white, and then they are black at the end. The females, right before they're getting ready to lay their eggs, their abdomens will swell up and they're a bright yellow color. But however, most of the rest of the time, uh, the females' abdomens and the males' abdomens are more of a gray-brown color. Now, the uh, adults and the fourth instar nymphs have a few lookalikes that are worth noting. Um, for both fourth instar and adults, people can get them mixed up with box elder bugs and milkweed bugs, I think, because, you know, they've got that bright color and sometimes you see them in huge numbers that are rather startling. But if you look more closely at them, you'll notice that they don't have any of those white spots that spotted lanternfly do, and they don't have nearly as many black patches either. Now, for the adult lanternfly, the most common lookalike are uh, moths, particularly tiger moths and underwing moths, which again have those dull forewings, so top pair of wings, and brightly colored hind wings or bottom pair of wings. Um, however, neither of these types of moths have spots on their forewings. Instead, they either have this kind of cool stained glass pattern or they look like tree bark. Another big lookalike for the adult lanternfly are the giant leopard moths. These, however, are more of a pure white color and they have spots from the tip of their head all the way to the base of their wings. And if you look really closely at them, sometimes you can see this like really lovely iridescent color on there too. Now the egg masses. These are tricky. These are very difficult to spot. The egg masses are about an inch and a half long usually, and they contain anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs each. They are covered in this gray brown putty like coating that helps them, it really makes them blend in with the surface that they're laid on. And they can be laying just about anywhere outside, um, everything from tree bark to couch cushions. So as long as it's a flat enough surface for them to fit their eggs on there, they'll, they can lay their eggs on them. Um, so the putty like coating sometimes is a little squiggle at the end. Uh, sometimes it's only partially covered so you can actually see those eggs, which are kind of an oval. They're like a little seed shape all in a row. Uh, sadly, even uh, if they are uncovered, they can still hatch out. So that doesn't really help us. Now the egg mass lookalikes. Um, there's a few of them. Uh, spongy moth egg masses uh, look an awful lot like lanternfly eggs, but if you look more closely, you'll notice spongy moth eggs are kind of fuzzy, uh, or their egg masses rather are kind of fuzzy, whereas spotted lanternfly egg masses are, it's almost like a, like waxy or like a, like again, like a putty uh, texture to them. Sp spongy moth egg masses also have little round eggs that you can sometimes see in them, whereas those lanternfly eggs are really more of an oval seed-like shape. Uh, another lookalike are praying mantis egg cases. However, praying mantis egg cases are like little styrofoam packing peanuts. They're, they're more three-dimensional, whereas spotted lanternfly egg masses really look like they were just scraped onto something. And then finally, there are all sorts of types of lichen and mushrooms that look an awful lot like spotted lanternfly eggs, uh, egg masses. I know they have fooled me a few times when I've been out in the field, um, but there's a, there's a couple tricks for telling the difference. First off, look at how thick it is. If it looks like it was just spray painted on, like it's really, really thin, or if it's uh, thicker than the nail on your pinky, probably not spotted lanternfly eggs masses. Um, if it is any color other than gray-brown, 
So if it's kind of got an orangey tint or a blue tint or anything like that, probably not spotted lanternfly. And then finally, if it's like peeling up at the corners or if it has almost like a leafy like structure to it, probably not spotted lanternfly eggs. All right, and with that, that is the wrap up of the overview. And I just wanna remind you again, we're gonna say it a bunch during this talk, but if you see something you think is a spotted lanternfly or any other type of invasive species, please report it. Even if you're not sure, if you think, you know, I'm pretty sure it's one of these lookalikes that was on one of these slides, but I'm not positive, snap a picture, send in a report to us. I am perfectly happy to look at pictures of native insects all day rather than miss a spotted lanternfly report. So it's better to be safe than sorry. And when you send in a report, if you can take a picture, um, we do encourage reports, even if they don't have pictures, but that picture is incredibly helpful to us. Uh, and then also note your location. You can send in a report at the link that's on the screen now or in uh, the Q use the QR code. And we'll also put that link in the chat. All right, and with that, we have our first quiz question. Thank you. Before I launch this poll, which I guess will give folks an extra few seconds if they weren't paying attention to run back to their computer. Um, I just wanna say, I, we are not able to enable closed captioning during this live session. I have enabled it for future sessions and we'll make sure that captions are added to the recording for people that need to go back. And I really apologize for the inconvenience, but there's no way to add the captions without completely ending the webinar and restarting it. All right, I'm going to launch this poll. This is a true or false question. The poll should be showing up on your screen, whether you are on a mobile device or on a desktop. And the question is true or false, spotted lanternfly only feeds on tree of heaven. And your options would be, well, either true or false. I guess I don't need to read all the answers. Um, Right now, we've got about 86% of people participating, which is great. Um, I'm going to leave this open for another few seconds until we get close to 100%. Remember, if you're looking for license credits, you do need to answer all of these poll questions. If you're just here to learn, we'd still also love for you to try to answer these. Um, and for folks looking for credits, you don't have to get the right answer to get the credit. You just need to participate. All right, we're at 94%. I'm gonna go for another five seconds or so. Uh, three, two, one. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. I'm happy to say that we have a 99% correct answer here. Um, that of course, spotted lanternfly feeds on several other hosts besides Tree of Heaven. And I will share the results with you guys. So you can see we had a pretty good response there. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back over to you, Elizabeth. All right, and uh, that is the end of our, our overview. So I am going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, hand, oh wait, unless, nope, nope, I already wasn't sharing anymore, Never mind. I am going to hand things over to Astra now, who will give us an update about Spotted Lanternfly in Massachusetts. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Let me see if I can get situated here. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Perfect. Great. Let me just move this guy over to this screen. Okay, so I'm um, the SLF survey lead for MDAR, so I'm out in the fields um, looking at these guys all day, every day, and I'll give you a little update about our activities um, so far this winter. Um, so I don't know how many people have been to our other webinars, but as a little recap and maybe a new information for some of you, um, Massachusetts currently has four populations um, that we're aware of. And um, those are in Fitchburg, Worcester, Shrewsbury, and Springfield. So we have three populations in Worcester County. 
and one population in Hamden County, again, that we know of so far. So to compare these infestations a little bit, um, our first and smallest is in Fitchburg. Um, it originally started out as only a couple of trees on one property. Um, and then uh, we got a report of a fourth instar um, on a vehicle and we went out there to check it out, found a tree um, that had adults in it a couple weeks later as we did our survey. And um, it kind of stayed there for a while um, and we were doing a quarter mile survey. So that's what these circles are is a quarter mile um, radius. And each of these squares is a kilometer squared. So as we did our first quarter mile, um, didn't really see too much going on. And then we expanded out a little bit. Um, and later in the season, we found egg masses um, across the same property. Um, and that triggered another quarter mile and we didn't find anything outside um, of those few other egg masses that we found. So the area is pretty urban, but it's not necessarily industrial and it's near to the rail. And um, so SLF has a habit of being brought to other places via transportation lines. So railroads, trucking, et cetera. So we're not sure how this one got there, but um, it could have been the railroad because it is right next to um, that line of transportation. So Shrewsbury we found next. And at first we only found a few egg masses um, right at the end of December in 2021. So just found a few egg masses, um, but when we went back later, and you can see our original survey was this quarter mile. When we went back later um, in the season when adults were around, we actually found um, a bigger population a little ways away um, of adults. So it's kind of spread out a little bit now, um, but still not a huge population. But it is a heavily transported area. There's a lot of trucking. Um, so again, there's risk of spread um, from that. And then we found Springfield and we got that through another public report. Um, and someone saw an adult lanternfly in the parking lot of their, their workplace. So that triggered another quarter mile um, survey, which is this main area here. Um, so there's many more SLF in Springfield than we found in Shrewsbury or in um, Fitchburg. And it's about a quarter mile. Um, and then, you know, it's got some offshoots that we found. So it's again, it's a heavily industrial area, lots of trucking. There's a railroad spur that goes right through it. Um, so, you know, it could have been brought up many different ways. Um, from all that transportation. And then we got another public report and we discovered a population in Worcester. And this one is spread out quite a bit further than any of the other infestations. Again, these are kilometer squared grids. Um, as you can see, that basically fills up that whole grid, goes halfway down into the next one, goes halfway into the one to the west. Um, so it's pretty big. We spent a lot of time out there, boots on the ground, surveying and trying to delimit the edges of that population. Um, we do have a few sightings a little farther away of like a couple individuals at a time, but the main population is like right there um, in this part of Worcester. And it's a highly urban area, um, but it covers commercial, residential, and other types of properties. Um, so there's all types of stuff in there. Um, there is a railroad that goes through it. Um, there's actually not too much that we've seen along the railroad there so far, but it's just a way for these things to spread. Um, so we've been out there at all four of these sites, um, surveying, delimiting. A lot of our survey was done um, during the time when these things are adults. So from late July all the way into November, December, just depending on when we have a hard freeze and the adults die off. 
Um, but the other thing to note is that they're very active during their breeding season and they will migrate um, from where they fed originally to, to try to find other mates. So while we've delimited this so far, we think um, there's a definite possibility that it could have gone a little farther. And so our next survey steps for next year are to go to those outside areas and continue to see how far out they've spread. Um, so right now we're doing our winter survey. So the adults have passed, and this is actually a picture of a dead adult. Um, a lot of times they will cling to the trees, um, just dead all winter. You can kind of tell that this one's kind of desiccated and um, this spot, which is its antenna, I believe, is usually like an orangey color. Um, and it's kind of, it's dried up and it's just turned, you know, gray, but they'll hang on to these trees. Like you need a good windstorm or something to knock them off. And often you'll find them scattered along the leaf litter underneath the tree as well um, for those that have fallen off the trees. So right now our survey is looking for egg masses. Um, so there's some pictures here. Um, this is like a super densely covered kind of, it was like a not in a tree, you can see there's just, you know, like a dozen egg masses there, all layered one upon another. Some have hatched, these are older egg masses. Um, but what we do for the survey is we return to the parcels that we had previously seen adults at, and we search all materials, um, organic, non or inorganic, um, around the area of each point that we put in that had adults. Um, so, and depending on how many adults that we saw, we'll go a certain distance away. Um, so the fewer adults will go, you know, a, we'll do a smaller grid around it. Um, the more adults it had, the larger we'll look around the area. But we're trying right now um, to find these egg masses, record them, and then scrape them. So we're trying to mitigate the population as best we can by destroying as many egg masses as we can while they're inactive. Um, so how we do that um, is we press either a scraper or um, like a credit card size plastic card onto the eggs to pop the eggs, and then we scrape away the leftover mass. Now, if you think you see an egg mass um, somewhere, we ask that you take a picture, and then if you can scrape it, um, pop the eggs and scrape it into like some hand sanitizer or alcohol or something, um, just so you can be sure that the eggs are fully destroyed. Um, so we, for those we can reach, you know, we pop the eggs, we scrape the leftover mass, and then we have actually um, 24 foot extender poles with a slightly um, angled paint scraper on it that we use to get the egg masses higher up. And you can see this is a picture of one of our surveyors actually scraping something that's pretty high up, probably like 15 feet high. So, you know, we're we're getting as many egg masses as we can. Um, while we're doing that. And, you know, we, we're we surveying with binoculars. So what we can't reach with um, the scraper pole, we're recording so that we know um, generally how many egg masses are in a parcel. And we go parcel by parcel um, and record that information so we can decide what to do about those areas later. So, so far this winter, we've scraped about 5,500 egg masses. Um, this is actually a picture of some egg masses we found just on a stray piece of bark. Um, it's actually the underside of the bark uh, in Worcester. And you can see there's three egg masses right there. You can see the size of them really well. These are relatively weathered. Um, and then there's actually an uncovered egg mass over here. But we've scraped about 3,600 egg masses um, just on three parcels of land in Springfield, by far the heaviest amounts that we've seen this winter um, were in Springfield. And we think that's probably because that population is a bit older um, than the other populations we've seen. And so they've had time to really breed and be prolific and they have, you know, good 
post material there. So they really went to town with the egg masses. Um, so in Shrewsbury, we found about 300 so far in Shrewsbury. Um, and then most of the rest of the egg masses that we found have been in Worcester. Um, in Fitchburg, because it's such a small population, um, we really haven't seen too, too much and we haven't seen them spread very far from the original point that we um, found them in. So that's good news there. Um, so our next steps um, for 2023 are going to be treatment. We actually did a couple treatments in Springfield and in Shrewsbury. Um, we did some bifenthrin treatment treatments in the fall to try to knock down the breeding populations a little bit before they could lay egg masses. Um, but we're looking into doing more treatments where we can. So we're actually, you know, really looking into each of these infestations to decide where to target the treatments and where we think will have the most effective um, means of getting, you know, slowing the spread of these populations. And we'll also continue with our visual surveys. So we'll go back into each of these populations and we will, you know, try to delimit, see if they've spread further. We're gonna be counting um, insects to see what our hatch looks like, what our population numbers look like. Um, so, you know, as soon as like May rolls around and the first hatch is reported, we're going to be out there looking, probably um, putting out traps um, and trying to get an idea of what the numbers um, of those populations look like. And so we're also going to be responding to public reports, which I mentioned we've had many public reports that actually led to us discovering a population. So if you do think you see something please take a picture and send the report in to massnrc.org slash pest slash slf report aspx. And that is our reporting website. Um, and really like the public is one of our first lines of defense of finding these populations and being able to try to mitigate the spread in Massachusetts and, and to our other New England states. Um, so really I urge you if you think you see something please report it. Like Elizabeth said, even if it's a native species, she'd rather see that all day, um, as would we, at least we know people are aware um, and reporting. So with that, I will end my slideshow here. Um, Thank you, Astra. Uh, Phil, yeah. we're gonna go right to you if you're ready to share your screen. I see a bunch of questions coming in. Please keep them coming if you guys have questions for Astra, but I just want to switch over to Phil. I'm conscious of us being a bit behind schedule and I appreciate everyone's patience. Go for it. Phil. Sorry, I think that was probably no. my fault. It but. is <laughs> not just your fault, but Phil, don't worry. It's everybody's fault. We always do right, this. Sure. Yeah, oh, I'm happy to well start. Thank that you. looks okay? Looks good. All right, excellent. So. Um, yeah, so I um, wanted to um, present some of our research findings. I'm just going to turn off my video here while I talk. So um, just looking at field treatments for the egg masses that you saw pictures of, and then also looking at different methods, uh, some alternative methods to bifenthrin and some other hard chemicals for treating the adults. Uh, I'm located on the Cape. Uh, we have our small research lab within our agency, the USDA. Uh, pest protection and quarantine. Um, used to be called the Otis Lab. Started with uh, Gypsy Moth research back in the 60s. And uh, we've then expanded to other forest insect pests, including uh, Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer. And then most recently, I've been very involved with uh, spotted lan lanternfly treatments. Uh, you can see this nice picture of the wheel bug attacking the spotted lanternfly. Um, this picture was uh, enlarge a little bit. Always nice to see a cool picture. This is uh, taken by one of my technicians that works with me. Uh, so there are some natural controls out there, but obviously there are so many spotted lanternflies, we just can't get to all of them. So uh, one of the methods that, we, that I've been looking at is the use of this soybean oil. It's called golden pest spray oil. And it's 93% uh, soybean. It's OMRI certified, so for organic growers can use it. For egg masses, it is used in a 50-50 mixture, one-to-one, 
and it can be do it, uh, applied as a spot treatment. So you can see the egg masses, as you've seen other pictures, they love rusty metal, um, tree trunks. Uh, this is a Christmas tree. This is one of the first finds in New Jersey that somebody brought a, bought a Christmas tree in Pennsylvania and then brought had the, the lantern flies actually hatched out in their house because they left their tree up for so long. Uh, so that was an interesting story. But you know, when you have these large areas and you could squish all of them, or um, I think another option is to do this uh, pest treatment with the oil. Uh, so situations like this where it might be hard to scrape all those because of the surface of the bark is not smooth or there's underneath the bark. This is work I've been doing for a couple of years. Um, this is a study from 2019, it's a report. And uh, this is some of the results just real quick, tested a bunch of different products, traditional insecticides. And then you can see for the controls here, you don't, all the egg masses don't hatch out, even with the, the control group that was not treated. There's uh, 20, 30, sometimes in this case, it was up to 40% of the egg masses just don't hatch, uh, just were not viable. Um, but you can see the ornamental um, oils, the horticultural oils, uh, the golden pest spray oil, and then the bonide actually, the label only allowed a 77% uh, formulation to be treated. Um, but the golden oil has a specific label that allows it to be treated at a one-to-one. -one. So that worked just almost just as well in this case uh, for this study as some of the traditional insecticides. Uh, bifenthrin and even chlorpyrifos. So uh, several years ago, we uh, designed a data tool because we want to test how good the field applications were using this treatment, this oil treatment. Um, so you can see here the egg masses are identified um, by push pins. And then we also had the data tool that would allow us to go back and um, GPS those locations and refine the trees. And then after egg hatch, after the treatments, and then the egg hatch in June, then uh, we could go back and look at how many insects had uh, hatched out of those eggs. So this is the treatment scenario, it's just a simple application with the oil here. And we did this for two years and we had four different states that were participating in this. And these were um, personnel crews, field crews from our organization. Um, and over 3,000 egg masses were treated and then monitored um, post-hatch. So what did we find? This is, uh, let me just explain the graph real quick. In the, in the red colors are the 2021 treatments and the green is the 2022 treatments. And then we have a categories of how many of those egg masses didn't hatch at all. So these are our control trees and the darker hues then will be the treatment. So, this is what we want to see. Treatment greatly increases no hatch. Uh, that happened both years. And then you have these middle categories. Um, usually when you see an egg mass, you'll see a whole bunch of adults hatching out, or not adults, uh, nymphs hatching out. And you can see the other impact of the oil besides the 0% hatch increasing that happening uh, was also decreasing greatly both years, decreasing the big hatch events. So just to summarize that portion, uh, we had two years of field data. We had up to that one year, we had up to 70% of the egg masses resulted in zero hatch because of the treatment. Overall, um, for the two years we had between 73 and over 80% hatch. You saw in that previous graph that I had um, with the different products, uh, that year we had up to 95% um, hatch reduction. Uh, another factor uh, we looked at when it can be applied, and it can be applied uh, right after the eggs are laid up to right before they're starting to hatch out in April or May, um, doesn't matter. Um, the other impact that we saw and that was not captured in these numbers here is that we can see a degradation in the egg mass integrity. And so you can see because of the oil treatment, you get a breakdown in that um, coating and you get eggs sloughing off and there's probably additional mortality that we are, we're not capturing with our field data. All right, so we'll go to our review question. Thank you, poll question number two, let's see. I can do this. Okay, here we go, people. 
What is golden pest spray oil made from? You have four choices. The first is petroleum oils. The second is soybean oil. The third is a 50-50 mix of soy and petroleum oil. And the final answer would be a product that cannot be used by organic growers. Remember that if you're looking for pesticide credits, you need to answer this question, but you don't need to answer it correctly. We hope you get the right answer, but uh, we're just looking for participation. We've got about 84% participating so far. So I'm going to leave this open for another, oh, we're really behind time, guys, maybe another 10 seconds from now. So get in there and answer. I'll, I'll be able to crank through, Jen, so that I don't. People don't have to worry about it's going to go over 11. I'll, I'll be able to finish. Thanks. I mean, we do have till 11.15 for Q&A at least, but yeah, that thanks. Yeah, no, we can go past, but I, I should be finished with the presentation by 11. Okay. No I still see a couple answers coming in. We're at 9%. There we go. 94%, sorry. All right. I'm going to end the poll in four, three, two, one and poll and share results. And you should be able to see that the majority, 86% 86 correctly answered soybean oil. Thank you. Uh, and just a quick reminder to folks raising their hand, please put questions into the Q&A. We can't call on you any other way. Go ahead, Phil. All right. So a uh, second uh, study that we've been working on is use of uh, what we call myco insecticides or fungal products that are insecticidal. Um, these are native fungi, environmentally friendly. You can see the outgrowth uh, once these infections take place. It's just a, a fungal spore that gets uh, attaches itself to the insect is able to grow successfully. So there are formulations of these products. These are the three that we tested. Uh, two were uh, powder formulation, the WP formulation, the Botanigard, and then this uh, other company, uh, BioSeries, that's an, another wettable powder. And then there was another uh, product formulation uh, emulsifiable uh, solution of Botanigard. And the um, spore counts are, are listed there on the label as well. So we tested these three products to see if we could impact the spotted flies. And the way that we, we um, were able to consult with an insect physiologist, and uh, he said that within three days of uh, the application, we could then test their hemolymph with this stain. So we take a, pull a leg off, spinal enterprise had been killed in the freezer, uh, still fresh, and then we could squeeze out a little bit of their, their blood or hemolymph, and then look for the spores within that. So just three days post-treatment, you can, once it's infected and you see it in the blood, and he assured us that uh, that insect will then die. So you can see under just a our microscope, you can see under 40X, you need to go up to about 400 magnification before you can see the hyphae that are within that insect. So that insect would have died if we hadn't killed it in the freezer. So this is early on, we were looking at the nymphs and uh, how, how good we were able to detect the, those hyphae. So this is the Botanigard, the BioSeries we were able to get later in the summer, end of June, we tested those. And then of course the control water, we didn't get any we didn't get 100% uh, detection in there, so it started to fall off a little bit. Um, this is our treatment methodology. We Later on, we tested the four phases of adults, um, early and mid and late, which is when they're uh, migrating and dispersing. So this is our experimental setup. That's how we treated with a, just a little pump sprayer and a cup, uh, and then put those insects inside these cages. So we had two groups. Um, of exposure. Uh, one of these cages, the field cages this is on Tree of Heaven, is uh, for two weeks, just leave it in there for two weeks. And then the other was uh, just a four to five days and then take it off and look for the hypho growth. So this is the outgrowth that you can see on the adults after the two weeks. And then we were looking for, can we just look for four to five days later and not have to worry about keeping these insects alive? Because that's always an issue. Uh, for this insect. So you can see the outgrowth from these, all the formulations, they all work to some extent. We got outgrowth. Um, this is um, the hyphae detected within from the adults. And you can see here later in the summer for all three formulations, we had really bad 
results for that. It was just very difficult to get um, that method to work for the insect. So what did work? Oh, we got another poll question. So we'll do that real quick. Oh, I was not expecting that. Hold on one second. And then I will finish up on the myco insecticide and how which formulation worked best. Excellent. Okay, it's our it's poll question number three. Your question is, where are female spotted lanternflies least likely to lay their eggs? And your choices are pine needles, tree of heaven, any flat surface, or rusty metal. We're going to leave that open for a few seconds. As people answer. Okay, we've got some also got some good questions coming into the Q&A, which is great to see. Keep those coming in as well. All right, we're at 92%. I'm going to leave this open for another 10 seconds so that we can move on. Some responses are still coming in. Thank you, everybody, for participating. We're going to end this in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and I'm going to share the results. Let's see. We managed to trick a few people, I think, this time. 76% uh, did correctly answer pine needles, but I think the reality is, is we're finding that when they're ready to lay eggs, they tend to just lay them virtually any place. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Phil. All right, excellent. So here's the results then for um, uh, the, the myco insecticide treatments. And uh, this is the three formulations of Botanigard, the ES formulation of Botanigard, and the BioSeries. And these are our water controls. So looking at uh, mortality um, four or five days or two weeks after treatment, um, you can see here in gray here, I've outlined, we had really good uh, results, much, much better than um, the other products with the ES formulation of the botanical guard product. So we, you know, we had after two weeks, we were killing almost all of them with at all three different um, experiments, uh, the three, the four different stages of adults that we, we treated. Uh, so if I can go on and just finish up just real quick and just take a few minutes here. This is another project looking at, can we trap out and collect spotted lanternfly egg masses. And these are some of the traps that we set out this past year. Uh, with purpose, if we could get them to lay eggs where we want them to, we can, multiple reasons, we can do it for research purposes. Um, people are always doing experiments of the egg masses in, in the laboratory, but also, you know, just for population detection, if there, it's, it's a new area, if we put out these egg mass traps, um, possibly that would be a, a use and then also assessing the population, how, how concentrated, how heavy is the infestation, um, especially if they're laying eggs way up in the tree, we, we can't always see those. And then also just for trap and removal of the, those populations. So I've been working on this for several years, um, actually five years. And uh, the year before 2021, we tested these panel traps and we put this asphalt material that seemed to like that and we put that covered or uncovered and we tested that out and had all kinds of traps set out. And we were only getting three to five egg masses per trap. So that's not really worth our time to set out traps like that because you could just go hunt and find your own egg masses by the amount of time that would spend to set out these traps. So um, looking at all of our data and approaches and methods, we, we decided that we try putting the asphalt material instead of on a trap away from the tree, put it right on the tree. This is just shingle material comes in a roll. And then uh, that same material flipped around backwards. So this is that plastic backing, the sticky backing for that asphalt shingles material. So you can see we tested and looked at a couple different approaches, horizontal versus vertical traps. We set it up in uh, six different locations, had a little over hundred traps. And early on, we saw, hey, there's a couple egg masses. Here's a female right there caught in the in the action there. And there's another egg mass here. A couple of weeks later, 
We looked again and you can see that the asphalt surfaces are on this side. This is some batting material that keeps the insect from uh, pushing through the trap. And then basically, you know, they'll get stuck in there, not stuck, but they'll crawl in there. They'll feel, they'll feel like they can lay some eggs. And, you know, here's one crawling on the outside. They'll just crawl up and out when they want to. So here's the results. So these were the six different sites. Um, you can see the horizontal. They didn't really like that at all. They weren't interested if it was horizontal orientation, but, you know, the normal behavior is for them to crawl up and down things. So uh, you can see here, sometimes uh, on average, for the average trap, uh, we got over in this site, we had 54 uh, some egg masses average per trap. We had a couple traps that we had over 100 egg masses in those traps. And this is when we were taking them down. You could see uh, just egg masses everywhere. And this is useful because we can actually cut out individual egg masses uh, from the roofing material and then use those. Or if people wanted to destroy them, they could um, just take them and throw them in the dumpster, bag them up and throw them away. So that's all I had. Um, I think we're finished on time. And a couple minutes early, happy to take any questions on the research. I did not expect us to end early. That's great. Thank you, Phil. Well, I went a little faster. So. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you um, so much for presenting what I believe is really interesting research. Um, let me just go up here and look at the questions. Um, Astra, I think I would like you to uh, take this one. I'm also going to Oh, no, wait, I need to wait on the q and A. I have a few slides left. I apologize. Really discombobulated today. Um, okay, let's go back here. A quick how you can help. Um, I know a lot of you saw this last time, but depending on what field you're coming from, we would really like you to check out some of our outreach materials for tips on how to slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. Things like checking your vehicles and equipment before you leave a site if you know there was lanternfly there and checking when you arrive avoiding moving firework uh, firewood and things like that uh, i put a link to these documents into the chat i'll put them in again during the q a but we have all these different checklists we have checklists for drivers we have posters that you can print out or you can order copies of these materials if you need multiple copies we have some of these materials in Spanish as well too, and we're working on translating them. Uh, another reminder about our reporting website, massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF. We still are asking people to report all fines that might change as we move through the different stages of spotted lanternfly infestation in Massachusetts. Here's another reminder about our pest newsletter. Please snap a, a photo of that QR code in the bottom left corner and subscribe. It is the best way to get all the latest information about invasive pests in Massachusetts. If you missed part of this webinar, or you want to share it with somebody, or you would like to look at any of our past webinars, we have them archived on our YouTube channel. You can go to bit.ly slash mdaryoutube. I'm also going to put that into the chat as well. You could watch hours and hours of spotted lanternfly content from us if you so desire. Uh, just want to say thank you again to everybody who attended. We're going to move to the Q&A portion of this presentation now. Uh, if you're looking for continuing education credits, including pesticide license credits, they will be processed by March 15th. Uh, but also, I would like just a note about checking your email for a link that we're going to send out to a short survey. We just we would like to hear from you about your impressions about our webinars and if there's any information that you're looking for that you haven't been getting. Our next quarterly update will be in May. And if you registered for this webinar, then you will receive a link when registration for that session is open. Okay, let's see. That was it. I'm going to stop right, sharing. And maybe I can just go through um, some of the um, the Q and A's for my portion. Right. So okay. I'm going to go through. I mean, unless you need to leave, I was. Well, no, I don't need to leave. It's just okay. I, I had 
I didn't know how to how to do it, so I had clicked that I had answered it live, but I, I didn't. So no, for, no, uh, you're not supposed asked, to be doing any. I'm. You don't need to do any of that. I'm going to handle the Q and A, and I'm going to let okay. them know whether things are getting answered or not. Okay. Uh, well, sorry well I had clicked. I had clicked answered live, and I didn't answer it yet. So. Okay, we. I I'll catch it if you, if you don't catch it. But I there was a question I wanted to funnel to Astra first, which is just that um, someone was asking. You know, are we treating known sites to try to eradicate? And then there was this sort of like a sub question: Are they found? Are they all found on Atlantis? Like what your, I guess the egg masses. But the more the first part of that question is probably the most important to answer. Sure. Um, so SLF can be found on virtually any organic or inorganic material. Um, their egg masses can. They'll lay them on anything. Um, adults. Well, um, Elizabeth put up that hundred host um, list. I mean, they'll they'll go to anything basically. I mean, they don't really feed on conifers, but they would still lay their eggs on them if that was all that was available, et cetera. Um, we're not treating to eradicate. Um, it's virtually impossible to do. Um, what we do try to do is at different times of the season, um, do different types of treatments. So we can um, do sentinel trees and Phil actually helped us with that this year. And that's to target what is what are known as hot trees, basically trees that the SLF seem to like more than others. Um, treat them with a systemic pesticide so that anything that feeds on those trees um, will die. Um, and that helps to knock down the population a little bit. And then we do, um, contact sprays at different times of the season, um, often in the fall when they're starting to breed so that we can knock down the breeding populations to um, try to stop them from laying eggs. Um, but it's, I mean, they've been in the US since 2014 now. Um, Pennsylvania has been trying really hard, but it's pretty impossible to to totally eradicate this this pest. Yeah, I mean, that's, we we've, our messaging is pretty much all slow the spread at this point. Um, oh, I think I caught 14 states. You. Sorry? Uh, established populations are in 14 states now. Right. Yeah. I think I found the question you accidentally said you would answer live. It's a two-parter anyway. Um, so I think this is a good question. I mean, are there any effective traps or attractants for spotted lanternfly? So I don't know if we have the same answer for this question as we would have five years ago, but um, yeah. Phil, maybe you want to weigh in and Astro might want to afterwards. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there are traps, uh, they call them circle traps for the adults that can be used. So it's uh, like a mesh, uh, you kind of circle around the trunk and it goes off of their behavior wanting to crawl up. And so there, it's a, it's a funnel and it brings them up and they go into a bag and then they can be collected that way. Um, they're sticky bands for the younger stages. Uh, they, that doesn't work well for the adults, uh, but there are issues with using sticky bands and other animals getting stuck on them. Uh, and Astra mentioned that we're, we have uh, a way to kind of monitor our chemical treatments if we treat it with a systemic insecticide. Um, I mean, they're going to die anyway if, if they're on those trees but we can monitor how much mortality we have with some traps there as well, or just putting a tarp under a tree if it's been treated. Um, Astra, is there anything else you guys are using? I think you covered it. Okay. All right, good. Uh, just a quick question I'm gonna get out of the way. Um, we do hold these webinars every quarter, so four times a year. I mentioned that our next one is in May, but we intend to do the, the cycle again. You know, we do February, May, August, November. Every one of them is worth the same uh, continuing education credits. So I just wanted to answer that. Um, okay, hold on, let me go back up again. Uh, all right, I'm not sure who, well, maybe a few of you wanna answer this. Are you seeing any negative impacts that spotted lanternfly may be having on native insects, birds, or other animals? And then specifically, is the sooty mold or the honeydew possibly affecting things like caterpillars who might eat the plants that spotted lanternfly are feeding on? Anyone wanna grab that one? 
Um, I mean, I, it's a really, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if I can like fully answer it, um, but particularly the, the city mold question is very interesting. Um, I will say that there are several different types of insects that feed primarily on grapevine. So if you have spotted lantern fly either killing most of or decreasing the amount of grapevine available to them, um, that's going to severely cut back on the host plants that those native insects have for themselves. So that's a potential impact. Um, it's an additional food source for various types of sticking insects. I mentioned yellow jackets. Um, I, if you've if you've been to other talks that I've given, you've probably heard me say this before. But I actually watched as a as a hornet and a yellow jacket fought each other so that they could get direct access to that honeydew right from the lantern fly. Like they weren't trying to kill it or anything; they just wanted that honeydew. So that's an added food source to them. And yeah, so it's, I, do you, do you, Phil or Astra, have you heard anything more about how it might affect insect populations? I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that there's any direct impact on other insects, but sure, if, if right under those trees where they're infested, if there's black sooty mold, the, the plant material is not going to be very edible to them or healthy. Um, but, but, you know, and, and Tree of Heaven is the primary host, and uh, that's also an invasive. So over the years, if, if they are fed upon by high populations of spotted lanternfly, you, that those trees can, can die. But it's not really an impact because it's an invasive tree. And there's not a lot that feeds on Atlantis just because it is a, an invasive tree. So I, I will be interested to see, you know, as, as more complex ecological studies are able to be done, the impact that we might be seeing because of the impact to wild grape, because we have so many insects, native insects that use wild grape as a host plant. But mm -hmm. I think it's going to be kind of complex to, to tease that apart from other environmental factors Sort of mm -hmm. like the studies that they did with winter moth, where they showed that it it was impacting the it wasn't killing trees outright, but native trees were growing more slowly. And no one's really sure exactly what kind of impact that's going to have in the long term. You know, it's just the growth rings are smaller for decades on plants that were impacted by winter moth. So if there's anyone out there who's looking for a uh, PhD project, I this is, it looks like an open topic, uh, and I, I'd love to know the answer to it. Um, all right, a few. I think these are going to be for you, Phil. Um, does the native do the native fungal spores? Does that application infect other insect species? Yes, uh, those are native fungi, so they, they can infect other insects as well. So, uh, but if we're applying them directly, the formulations right to the spotted lanternflies, then it's not going to significantly impact uh, other things. Now, if you're doing a broad scale treatment in the woods and just trying to spray everything, then, then yes, you, you could, other insects will be susceptible to that. Um, there was one question right before, was regular horticulture oil tried? Um, I did, uh, early on, I did try some bonide at a 7% for the egg masses. Um, the golden pest spray oil is kind of unique in that the label allows for a 50% one-to-one -one mix of the oil. Um, and usually horticultural oils, you don't want to go above two, 3% anyway, because if you're applying it when uh, plants are growing, you're going to burn them. Uh, so that 50% is just for the egg masses, direct application. Um, and then there's that next question there about testing it at two and three percent. Yes, we have used that golden press, pest spray oil and other horticultural oils at the two or three percent rate for nymphs and adult lantern flies. And what we saw there is um, we did get some control, fairly good control, up to 80 percent um, with uh, Lesco horticulture oil and also the golden pest spray oil at two at a 3% rate uh, for both of those did pretty well, but for the adults, it, it didn't work very well. 
Uh, scraping with an insecticidal treatment. I'm not sure. Uh, it's okay, would... Bill, I'll, it's okay. Let me read the questions to you. Sometimes oh, they're okay. going to be out of order. Uh, sure. we'll, we'll get to all of them. I just want to make sure we're on like, yeah. So, so someone asked, have you tried scraping with an insecticidal treatment, which I thought was an interesting question to answer. Go for it. Yeah. If you just do scraping by itself, um, that should kill the, most of the eggs in that egg mass. Um, when we were doing our study, we we tested those different uh, pesticide products and the oil. And then I also, one of the other treatments I didn't show was I did scraping and I scraped it right into a um, like a container, a Petri dish. And then just to see like how many of those eggs survived, I wasn't trying to squish all of them, but I just kind of scraped the whole egg mass down and I was, you know, killing eggs as I went, but we did get hatch from some of those eggs. So if you have an egg mass of 30 to 50 eggs, if you're not squishing all of them, you're just scraping them down onto the ground. I think Astra mentioned that you should just put them into uh, some alcohol or soap solution to make sure those eggs are, are killed. So if you just scrape them off the tree or whatever surface onto the ground, some of those eggs could potentially hatch out. But I, I haven't done any insecticide plus scraping treatments. Okay. Uh, and then I think someone... the purpose in, in doing the, the sprays with the, the, the oils is just so you don't have to scrape. You could just do a treatment without scraping. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So someone had asked, you had recommended placing those shingles in bags and then putting in the, the dumpster. They're asking, shouldn't you destroy the egg masses first? So I, I would recommend, you know, cutting up the shingle material or folding it and then double bagging it so that if they do hatch, they will not be able to get out. And then you don't have to do anything further. Okay, perfect. You could also scrape the egg masses as well, but if you want to make sure you remove all those, then I, I would recommend just double bagging it. Uh, and then someone was asking if the treatment harms bees, but I don't know exactly which treatment they were referring to. I mean, as usual, we, we like to say, please be careful for any treatment. You need to follow the label. Uh, and there's often information on the label regarding um, protecting bees, but if you have anything to add. Oh, he was asking about the, thank you, Matthew. He was asking about the emulsifiable yep. concentrates. Okay, for the fungal treatments. Um, yes, I mean, it, for any insect, those insects are susceptible to do those Bavaria treatments. Um, so certainly, you know, follow the label, like Jen said, and, and it would be application timing and then, you know, where you're treating and making sure you're not treating near flowering plants and bees as well. And then there was a question at the end that I just wanna put in here. We're almost done folks, it's at 11.14. We always say we're gonna go for 11 to 11.15. We've somehow gotten back on time. Uh, but I put, just put a link in the chat because someone asked if spotted lanternfly has been verified on Cape Cod. We don't have any infestations on Cape Cod, but we've had sightings of lanternfly pretty much all over the state. If you would like to see where, please go to the link in the chat to our pest dashboard. That's a live map that is updated with information about spotted lanternfly and other pests of concern in Massachusetts. And you can see when and where spotted lanternfly was found and where the infestations are versus where just those individual like dead insects have been found. Uh, one more question that uh, Lance had um, would birds, et cetera, be harmed if they eat insects after they've consumed what is used to kill them? Um, you know, I, I don't think it, the, the, the fungal treatments don't have any action on, on I, I believe, on birds and mammals. Um, but if they're having, I can't imagine they'd it'd be very palatable if it's all fuzzy and fungusy tasting, they're probably just going to spit it out. Um, but if it's if they haven't had any outgrowth, I, I assume that, you know, the fungal spores would just be killed by uh, gastric juices and things like that. But I don't know if there's any studies looking at, at that. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I know there would be something on the label regarding, I mean, if assuming you apply according to the label of any registered product, there wouldn't, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, yeah, right. Because, you know, they have to go through testing for those products for um, 
injury to other animals and things. Anything? We're not going to get a Last of Us situation from that fungi anytime soon, anyway. I think it's hilarious that the world knows what cordyceps fungi is now. <laughs> All right. Any final words from our panel? We are out of questions. Okay. I, I had a question for the panel. Oh, no. Uh, just looking easy. at the map. I I love this map that you just sent that link to. So the blue is surveyed? No, it isn't survey. It's just a confirmed report. So it's a combination of sightings from the public and survey. But so the blue is somebody reported it. Yeah. I mean, anything. The majority of our finds have come in from reports from people, not from survey. I mean, even the Worcester one, technically came in from a report it just happened to be from the Asian longhorn beetle eradication program folks that were out looking for Asian longhorn beetle the the blue is like an individual find whereas yeah. the orange is like a, a actual population of lantern fly okay so blue is a report blue but not dead. an established population well, it's not, uh, just to clarify, blue is a confirmed find. It's not a report. We get lots and lots of reports. Most of them are negative. So we don't map those. If you click on each, if you click on each town, you'll see um, the details of the year that it was found and whether it's an infestation or just an individual find. Okay. And, and that's, well, that's like everything, tool. it's everything from like somebody finding a dead adult, you know, in a package they received to, uh, you know, people getting shipments with egg masses on them and, and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, that map is interesting to me just because it shows the, like that propagule pressure, like there's been so many chances for infestations. And yet so far we just have Worcester, Shrewsbury, Springfield and Fitchburg. And I asked her can correct me, but I believe all indications are that Worcester is, is probably a spread from Shrewsbury. It's not like it was an individual find that germ germinated into its own infestation. Yeah, I think there were probably multiple introductions in Worcester, but Shrewsbury was definitely part of it. Um, we can confirm that, you know, there's um, homeowners who have SLF on their property who actually work within the infestation in Shrewsbury. Um, so, but I think with the size of it um, and where we're seeing heavier pockets, that it was probably multiple infestation or multiple introductions um, that sort of merged into one, which is, probably how a lot of these happened all across the states um because like i was saying it's just so easy to transport these guys everywhere yes and if anyone is but for the people who are still on the call um they like to like they'll lay their eggs in wheel wells so if you're in an area where there's a big population particularly during egg laying season if you can check those wheel wells before you leave that can make a big difference in helping to slow down their spread. All right, I think we're gonna call it. <laughs> it's 1120. Um, give us a couple weeks to get this up on our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions or issues, I put the email into the chat. It's slf at mass.gov. Just shoot us an email. I wanna thank all of our panelists today, especially Phil for coming to us from the USDA and bringing all the really interesting new information about the research that's going on. We really appreciate that. Yeah, that um, was great, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. hopefully you'll see some uh, lampshade traps set out around <laughs> town somewhere. Definitely. Cool. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>